Welcome to the Photo Flunky Show, episode 95. Today, we're going to go over 10 photography mistakes that will make your photos suck. Hi, my name is William Beam. Hi, my name is Lee Beam. And I want to let you know that I have made all of these and more photo mistakes. <laughs> <that have> really <laughs> made some of my photos suck. But before we get to that, I want to let you know that show notes are going to be available at williambeam.com slash episode 95. And you get a transcript of the show there for free. And of course, there are links to subscribe to this show. And you can do that on iTunes, Google Play Music, and a few other sites. We've also got a player. If you just want to listen on the website, go to photoflunky.com and you can see it there. Also, I want to let you know that I've got a free ebook for you. It is called Creative Portraits. It is about the emotional and creative side of portrait photography, not the technical side. So it's not a lot about lighting or gear or any of that kind of stuff or which lenses to choose. It's about who your subject is and how you want to show them and what's important to them and how you tell that story coming through with your portrait photography. So go to williambeam.com slash free book. As I said, it is absolutely free. You can share it with a friend and tell us what you think about it. 10 photography mistakes that will make your photos suck. This is not really a criticism of people because I have made every single one of these mistakes and I'm trying not to make them anymore, but I, I just thought, you know what? We need a list to help other people because a lot of people are making these mistakes on a regular basis and I just really want them to stop it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. How, how cruel of me. All right, so let's go ahead and start off with the first one and this is an easy one to fix and that is using the wrong white balance. Yeah. If you ever get your photos back and you look at them and like they're too blue or they're too orange, or something's just wrong. And it's because you're out there taking your photos in the wrong white balance. Cameras are really good these days. You can set auto white balance, and it'll do a fairly decent job. But honestly, if you can choose your white balance before you get to your scene, it's really going to help. And it's very easy to forget this one, too, because you can go from indoors to outdoors and just keep taking pictures without thinking, oh, no, I need to change my settings. Yeah, I think the auto white balance also it depends. There, there are some circumstances where it doesn't work as well as others for example i tend to take my photos after a run very early in the morning so it's just kind of getting light and there is a natural color cast i don't necessarily want to lose that so auto white balance strips it and almost exaggerates it to the other end of the spectrum um, and i have to go back and tweak it to suit there's a couple of easy ways to correct this one is obviously with a setting that's on your camera two shoot in raw file so let's say that you do mess it up if you don't have JPEG that's kind of locked in or baked in what the color temperature is going to be, you can change it a little bit in JPEG, but if you're shooting in RAW, in post-processing, you've got the whole range that you can change it. Also, if you're setting something up and you've got a gray card, it's very easy. Put a gray card down, take a shot of it in the light that you're going to be doing, and then when you go to post-processing, you can just touch that with the eyedropper, and then you can adjust your photos afterward. One of the things I do with my cameras, if I've got a gray card, I will take a photo of that and set my white balance in camera. So that way, I don't have to worry about it in post. Everything looks fine just right there. But not every camera is going to give you that option. Horizon lines should not be going up and down. I mean, mountains may go up and down, but the horizon should be level. Whether it's at the top, the middle, or the bottom of your photo is kind of a creative choice. When I see a photo of an ocean and the ocean is leaning down to the left or the right, something about that just ain't right. Yeah, because the water is supposed to spill out, right? Exactly. It should be, you know, to have all the water on the other end. No, keep your horizon lines straight. If you can't do it in camera, which is obviously the best place to do it, at the very least, before you share the photo or before you print it, fix that in your post-processing software. Yeah. Bad horizon lines, it just ruins your photo right there. Now, there are times when you can get creative and cocky with doing off-kilter kind of photographs, but for the most part, you want to keep your you horizon You need the right lines. subject for yeah, that. Yeah, it's like you can always break the rules, but you need to make sure that you understand how they work in the first place. Yeah. All right, this is one of my favorites, not paying attention to the direction of light. I've seen some photos that I, I don't even understand why they were shared in the first place. The light is coming from one side, and yet your subject is facing the opposite direction. You know, you've got a nice hot spot on their ear, and their face is in shadow. I, I don't know. <laughs> and that's a, assuming it's going to be a portrait. But, you know, light direction, if you're outdoors, is changing all the time. You've got wonderful side light in the morning and sunset, and you've got high overcast light. It's not to say that you can't shoot in any of that light, but you really need to pay attention to the direction the light is coming and where it's casting the shadows. And also, is the direction of light favorable to your subject? Sometimes you just need to get up and move around, or yeah. if possible, change the way your subject is facing. 
And it depends on what it is. If you're doing something that's natural and it's just simply not going to move, then you need to get up and move. But the direction of light is really important to how you're going to capture that subject. And just taking a picture because you're standing here and you're too lazy to walk two feet or three feet over to the left or the right is just bad photography. Yeah. Pay attention to the direction of the light. Another one that we've noticed is just blurry subjects or bad focusing. And I've seen a lot of people do this and then try to save the photo with over sharpening. Yes. And then you get that kind of weird like outline on it and this grainy, gritty look. It's kind of crunchy looking. And look, there's nothing wrong with having bokeh in your subject. In other words, the subject is sharp and the background is defocused. It's a wonderful way to highlight your subject. But if you don't have the eyes sharp and clear, if the details on a face aren't sharp and clear, or your subject just, you just missed the focus somehow, don't try to save it. You've missed it. Throw it away. Yep. It's that simple. All right. One of my pet peeves is bad backgrounds, basically busy photos. Or overflowing trash cans or a trash can in the background, for heaven's sake. If you're going to take a photo, look at your background first. And if it's too busy or there's something distracting, something that is going to take away from your subject, you need to move. Yes, or move the person or move the thing or whatever it is. Or if you can't move it, then you've just got a bad photograph. I mean, if if that background is going to be part of the photo no matter what, then yes, you can take the photo to document it, but you're not going to make a really nice photo if you've got a bad or distracting background. And that's not just for people either. I mean, you take a photo of a plate of food. I mean, you've seen me, a guy's moved, hand, shadow, there's something in the background. Somebody's crumpled up a wrapper from their straw or their napkin. I want that stuff out of my shot. You want your viewer to concentrate on your subject. Anything that is not your subject or is not complimenting your subject is a distraction. You want to remove and distill until you get down to the essence of what you're trying to show. Yeah. Backgrounds play an important part of that. I mean, the color, the shape, and the textures of the background can complement your subject, or they can distract from it. So the what we're saying is really having just busy, bad backgrounds is not good for your photography at all. Yeah. All right, this next one I'm going to talk about is poor cropping. And I'm not talking about after the fact and post-processing. I'm talking about when you're taking the shot. I've got this other pet peeve. I hate seeing photographs of people without feet. You know, it's like just their ankles have been cut off, or they've got an awkward spot on their leg. Or they're missing a hand. You know, something that should be there isn't there, and and they're just not cropped in the right places. Another problem with poor cropping sometimes is if you're taking a travel scene, this kind of goes with bad backgrounds, but there are distracting elements that really ought to be moved out of your shot. I think another thing that happens, lean out of the bad horizon lines, because if you don't leave yourself wiggle room to straighten, when you straighten, you're going to have a crop as well. You're going to lose some of the sides and the, the up and down of it. And you are limited to your control, you know, once you level out. So how that's going to be cropped, it depends on how much you need to level out. And that can, I know it's in post-processing, but don't assume that your um, bad horizon line is going to be helped with good cropping. It's, it's just going to be a disaster on two counts. Absolutely. Or something that is on the edge of your photo as you shot it, when you do that cropping is maybe only be halfway there. Mm-hmm. We had a wedding photo, a family photo, and the way that was cropped eliminated a couple of the members of the family. Yeah, we noticed when we got the print, we thought, what is going on here? Yeah, it's like my aunt and... Uh, <laughs> and think, half of your mom's husband. Yeah, half of my mother's husband was, was it gone. Was like, um, and now mind you, this was photograph was, it wasn't one that we took. It was one the photographer took. It was something that we were going to give my mother our wedding photo. Yes. And it's like, well, there's only half of her husband and her sister's not there. Something's not right. Yeah. Bad cropping can really ruin a photograph. And along with that is bad composition. And by this, I'm not talking about necessarily what you've got on the edges of what's going to be in, but you need to have a foreground, a middle and a background. There's got to be some kind of depth to show what you're taking in your photos. Otherwise it's just going to look very flat. To the yeah. Viewer. There are some situations where that is what you need, but it's, it's the exception, not the rule in day to day photography. I, I think if like, if you're in a studio kind of taking portraits there or you're doing product photography, that kind of depth is desirable, but you can get away with just showing a flat image. Yeah. If you're taking travel photos, if you're doing architecture, if you're just street photography, you need to have something as a foreground, a middle and a background. It'll add a lot of depth to your photos. The composition will just really help you out a lot. And when I say foreground, I don't mean weeds. This is, this is something I've seen with a lot of portrait photographers lately. They, you know, they'll be going along a street and they think, okay, I need to put my model here. I've got something behind her. What am I going to put in front of her? Oh, I know. There's like some little weeds and brush or something that they put in front of her. No, you don't want to just obscure your subject just to have a foreground element. It doesn't have to be down at ground level either. It can be framing the photo on the side. It could be anything. And you know, if there isn't one, then leave it. Yeah. Then make the subject in the foreground. 
Make them the foreground. Don't ruin your subject in order to have a foreground Don't middle and background. Don't get too technical about checking all the boxes. Here's a good example. You know, the photograph I've seen taken many times, the lake up in Canada. You've got a rock. The lake goes out. There's a red canoe in the middle of the lake, and then there are the mountains behind it. It shows you from the shore to the lake to the mountains. You've got a sense of depth through the whole scene. That is an example of what we're talking about with composition to show your foreground, middle, and background. All right, this is going to be Lee's favorite. It's called bad exposure. There, there are just so many ways this can happen. Bad exposure can really do a number on your photographs, and it doesn't matter if you've gone too much in either direction, whether you've overexposed it and you've kind of killed all the detail. You've probably heard about clipping highlights a number of times. You can see what they're called blinkies. You'll see them on the back of your display on a camera, and when they're blinking on there, then you know that you lost detail in either the highlights typically or possibly also in the shadows. That's not just the only kind of bad exposure. The problem is I see things that are just way underexposed or way overexposed. And it's like the people who are taking these photos don't understand how to use the meter inside of the camera. Metering inside of DSLRs is really very good these days. It, it gives you a nice view of what should be an acceptable exposure. And that's without assuming any other you know, external lighting or off-camera flash lighting. You can make creative choices as to why you may want to darken an image or not. Sometimes those creative images aren't really creative. If your exposure is off, you're really not telling the story. Either it's too bright and you're losing detail or it's too dark and maybe you can't open the shadows up. It could be a matter that you've taken something then not really paid attention to your metering and then not paid attention to any post-processing to try and correct it. I think it's always going to be in your best interest to get this right in camera. Trusting your aperture priority or your shutter priority it doesn't always get you a proper exposure simply because sometimes your camera cannot make the choice that you need, whether it be a longer time for the shutter to stay open or raising the ISO. There are a number of settings that you can change as a person going there and thinking about what you're going to do. That doesn't mean you have to do manual exposure all the time, but you need to pay attention to the meter. And if it can't make the center line know where you've got the correct exposure using the automatic settings, pay attention to that before you hit the shutter and then you may have to switch into manual mode and then just either open up your aperture, give the shutter more time to collect light. But these are very easy problems to fix. It's not really all that scary to go into manual mode either. I think it's a good thing to practice now and then. You don't want to do it all the time because if you're not thinking about it when you just get into action shooting, you may end up with you know, underexposed or overexposed shots. That's the beauty of aperture exposure or shutter priority exposure. Really, it's ultimately up to the photographer to choose the right mode and the right settings for the environment or the photograph that you need to take. Okay, the next item on our list is a boring subject. You know, sometimes you're out, you're excited, you're taking photos, and something that you think looks good, you get back and you look at it and say, you know, it's not that great. Just kill it. End it right there. Or keep it for yourself. It's not, you know, you don't have to share everything that means something to you. That you have to accept that some things, you take a photo of it and it's a nice memory, but you really had to be there. That, that's just the reality of it. When you show somebody else, it's greatness reduces to no. You know, I, I made this mistake. I was just looking at some of my photos from Cuba and there was a really wonderful sunrise coming through the trees. You could see, you know, the light coming through and, and there was a, a little bit of fog and having particulate matter in light just shows the rays of light. It's really, really wonderful. And the only subject that I had was the little house. I mean, it's not a house. It was like a little, you know, lodge where each room was a separate building. The sunrise and the sun rays were glorious. The building in itself was nothing. And I realized, okay, my subject was the light, but everybody else looking at this is going to think, well, that's really building. Just, yeah. It's just a crappy little building sitting there with some nice light on it. And I thought I've never shared those photos because there's nothing, there's no story to tell there. It's your memory. Yeah. I remember having that wonderful light. I was trying to capture it and I just didn't do it. That's one of the things that you either keep for yourself or you throw away, but it's not something that you want to put out and share because nobody really cares about a boring subject. And we've seen plenty of boring subjects put out there. And a memory is nice. And if you're sharing it as a memory, okay, I get it. It's a snapshot. But if you're trying to build an audience and you're trying to do something for your art, then you really need to be cautious about what you share and when you share it. All right, the last item on our list is not post-processing your photos. Even on our iPhone, we run them through some kind of software just to enhance them just a little bit. It doesn't have to be over the top, but you want to make sure that there's some contrast, the colors are tweaked, there's a bit of sharpening. Every single photograph you take with your DSLR 
needs sharpening. Yeah, and also I've noticed that the phone camera tends to underexpose most of my photos. It's just the way it is. It needs to have the exposure increase. It needs a tiny bit of sharpening. Um, that's pretty much those are the standard things. Maybe the shadows need to be lifted. Sometimes you need to lift the shadows. Sometimes you've got overexposure that in an area that needs to be brought down to the highlights and shadows. You need to change around. Sometimes just adding a vignette and placing the center and maybe brightening the center can just really make your subject jump out of the scene. Yeah. But every photo needs post-processing, even if it's just a matter of sharpening. Give it a little bit of a look there. A few little levers inside of Photoshop, or not even Photoshop, Lightroom, or on some of our uh, smartphone apps, you can really take a photo and just make it look wow. It's just five, ten seconds. It yeah. really is two or three little hits on a slider, and they're just nudges, not even, you know. Yeah, so it doesn't take that much to just make the difference between bland and spectacular. Those are the top 10 things for the mistakes that we see people make that just really kind of make their photos look less than spectacular. I use the word suck. Oh, it's direct. It's honest. It's direct. It's honest. We think that these are easy things to fix. Like I said, I've made every single one of these mistakes. And once you've made them enough, you've realized you don't want to make any more. So I just wanted to call them out and say, look for these things in your photos. Make the fixes where you can. Think ahead of time where you can. And you know what? Take all the pictures. I would never tell you not to take the photo, but evaluate it when you're done and don't try to save something that's just not worth saving. And with that, I hope this helps you just become a little bit of a better photographer. Thank you very much for joining us on the Photo Flunky Show, episode 95. Show notes are going to be available at williambeam.com slash episode 95, and you get a transcript of the show there for free. And of course, we would love it if you would subscribe. So check us out on iTunes, Google Play Music, Blueberry Stitcher, and we will have links to subscribe on the show notes as well. We'll see you again next week. Uh-huh.